What is happening, everybody? Welcome back to Tour Life. Today is November 5th, and you've got a solo dolo Brody show today. Yuli is out uh, celebrating his one year anniversary with his lovely wife. So, big congrats to them. Make sure you guys go over and show some uh, congratulatory comments on his Instagram. And uh, just going solo dolo today, giving this day off for Silas. Uh, I first will say, happy election day. Only thing I'm going to talk about politics right now. We pay so much money for all these different subscription services and streaming platforms. And now you can watch the Manning cast or you can watch the normal football game. I would pay, man, I would pay a lot of money to have a service or a streaming platform where I can watch my sports without the flooded amounts of political advertisements during the commercials. Uh, if that is something you are on board with as well, maybe we can get something going. But uh, that is the only thing you'll hear, hear me say uh, about politics. But we have a good little show for you guys today. The PDGA did just come out with the changes for their 2025 uh, rule changes that will basically go over a couple, highlight a couple of the ones. And then we have some really good listener questions this week that I'll dive into. Not too many crazy stories uh, in the disc golf world. I'm sure we'll start kind of getting some rumors of players moving here and there. That's pretty much what the most the off season is talked about is where players are going to go. Um, but before we jump into all that, I want to say thanks to our sponsor today, Manscaped. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Manscaped, the global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. Every man knows the unbeatable feeling of a fresh barber shop shave. Now, what if I told you that no longer you no longer have to wait weeks or even months between appointments to experience it? Introducing Manscaped's latest release, the Chairman Pro Package. The all-in-one set includes everything you need to recreate the luxury of a professional shave right at your home. Whether you're after that daily silky smooth finish or you prefer to maintain a rugged 5 o'clock shadow, the Chairman Pro Package has you covered. Head over to manscaped.com and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using the code TOURLIFE for 20% off plus free shipping. First up, we have the start of the show, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver. This just isn't any shaver. It comes with two interchangeable skin-safe blade heads. You have the skin-safe four-blade foil for that close, smooth shave when you're looking to go completely clean. And you also have the skin-safe stubble trimmer for when you want to keep a bit of that rugged look. But that's not all. The package also includes the Power Shave Gel to get the ultimate wet shave experience. This non-irritating lubricating formula is, mode specific, is made specifically to work with the Chairman Pro providing a smooth, comfortable shave. And to finish it all off, we've got the Face Shave Soother. This aftershave serum is a game changer. Use it after shaving to hydrate your skin and soothe any post-save irritation. It's designed to help reduce redness and define, uh, defend against ingrown hairs, which unfortunately I get sometimes and they're very, very painful, and also razor bumps. Get the Chairman Pro Package today and experience a shave that is as smooth as you deserve as everything you need to keep your face looking and feeling its best. All in one box, get 20% off plus free shipping with the code TORLIFE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code TORLIFE at manscaped.com. That reminds me, Silas, if you're watching this, I still need one of these. Please have them send me my Chairman Pro package immediately. Uh, I pretty much would use every single thing in this package. So please send that to me. And if you guys are interested, you know, Christmas, kind of around the corner. Kelsey's already throwing up de decorations uh, around the house. So good little Christmas gift if you're looking for one out there. All right, let's highlight some of the rule changes here that the PDJ just announced for the 2025 season. First one that I want to talk about is this new one with spotters. Now, this is always has been a very interesting, interesting part of disc golf because they do have the ability. We've done it at several courses on several holes where they turn a spotter into an actual official where you have to go with whatever the spotter says. 
Um, would I like them to do that on more holes? Probably. Yes, definitely. Uh, but I understand they probably want to shy away from doing that and putting a lot of the pressure and onus on the players making the call. This is normally, you normally see these official spotters on holes that are very hard for players to judge, whether it's blind or there's some sort of angle that obstructs us from being able to see what the disc is doing. Um, or if there's a Mando, I, I know the one out at GMC on Fox Run, uh, I believe it's hole like 13, I want to say. Um, there's a Mando, but it's over a hill, so you can't really see it that well. Uh, so I think it's great for that. Now, basically what this rule is, it's 801.02. It's the enforcement and 801.03 appeals automatic provisional from spotter's call. What it states is it states... This establishes that a player's throw from a lie determined by a spotter is automatically a provisional throw. This will improve pace of play and ensure players are disadvantaged by an incorrect spotter call. Now, remember that it says this will improve pace of play because we're going to we're going to talk about pace of play in a second here and I think it's funny that they actually threw that in here basically making the claim that doing this adding this is actually going to improve pace of play where they kind of contra i'll show you where they contradict themselves here in a second but what this basically means is if i throw a shot and i get up to it and there's a little flag in the ground and the spotter says that's where it crossed i now throw a shot from there and that is a provisional and then i can decide with the group where else you want me to throw essentially is what it looks like um I don't think this is really going to do much of anything. I think you're still going to have the players, and we know who those players are, that will argue for five feet no matter what, even when it's clear none of us had any good gauge on exactly where it went out. And you know we're 500, 400 feet away from the shot. The spotter's 50 or 100 feet with a much better angle. If we could all just go with the spotters, I think that would increase the pace of play. The, the real thing that's slowing here is the – players that suck and the players that want to try to take advantage and bully their self into getting better spots. That's really at the end of the day, what is causing pace of play issues. If everyone just said, Oh, spotter was right there. Great. Now, obviously there are some times where you'll throw a shot and a spotter is out of position. We can all tell that on the tee that the spotter was not in a good spot and the spot that they gave versus the spot that everyone on the card is drastically different. Normally that is discussed right after the throw, not when you get up to where your disc is. Um, but you're gonna get guys up there being like, oh, look where my disc is out of bounds. There's no way that it ever could be there. We never know what happens. We don't know if it hit a tree. We don't know if it caught up and started rolling. You don't know what happens a lot of times. So if you're watching this, please just take where the spotter gave you unless everyone on the card instantly is like yeah that's a terrible spot this is where you should play it from so i it, i don't know i think this was kind of a weird rule for them to change if anything to add it'll be interesting to see you know how players react to it i don't think it's going to change pace of play at all all right next one we're going to talk actually about the pace of play here and uh, a PDGA official, Robert Leonard, who I actually have had multiple conversations with this. If you guys remember, this is the PDGA official that me and Ezra talked about, talked to after worlds when we saw that the group in front of us had, I don't know, a two or three hole gap in front of them at the world championships. And we told an official, Hey, can you do something about this? And they basically just drove the opposite direction and did nothing. Robert Leonard was the official that we turned our scores in at the end of that round. And we you know, had a discussion with him. And uh, quite frankly, he didn't really seem to care too much. And also, this is really funny too, because he was claiming that he was looking at the PDGA app like PJ Live to see where players were on the course. Clearly he was not because shortly thereafter we left, he was, you know, talking to just some random fans or people there, clearly not on his phone looking at the situation of where players were um, during their tournament. So 
we're going to kind of break down some of the stuff he says in this interview over on Staggered Stance. And maybe, hey, maybe we'll get him on the podcast. Maybe uh, Silas, maybe reach out, get this guy on the podcast if he'll come on. We can ask him maybe some of the tough questions. And if he uh, gives answers that I I think are a little bit, you know, whether they're uh, skirting around the answers or just trying to answer with not actually answering, maybe we'll press a little bit more. But he went on the staggered stance and uh, he basically made a reason that his reason that pace of play was an issue was not actually on the players but it's actually more on the tournament setup, which is very interesting because I've never heard anyone from the PDGA make this claim before. His claim basically was, he made an example that if like each hole on a course takes 13 minutes to complete, but the tee times are 10 minutes apart, right? So in this example, the group, the first group to tee off would still be on hole one by the time the second group is teeing off, right? If there's 10 minute increments between tee times, but it takes 13 minutes to finish a hole, they would be basically teeing off while the group is still playing. They would have three minutes, let's say, left to play the hole. Um, He's claiming that this is actually the real issue. Um, No, that's not accurate at all. Now, if you're going to tell me that it takes 13 minutes to play a par three in your in your entire course is a par three course. And let me just do the math real quick. Let's see here. 13 minutes times 18. That's 234 minutes. Divide that by 60. That is almost a four hour round. If you're going to tell me that there's any course out there that's all 18 holes are par threes and it's taking you four hours to play it, I will give you $1 million. Uh, The 13 minutes, sir, it's because you have par fours and par fives, right? Like that, his example doesn't make any sense because for example, hole one at DDO, I think that's like probably the most common hole one that we can all kind of look at. That is a par five right? You're going to have people teeing off a lot of times before the group is done with the hole. To par five, you're throwing three shots. That's 12 shots with a group of four. And then you have four putts, maybe eight putts, maybe more, right? You have a lot of shots. That hole actually probably does take close to 13 minutes to play. Add in people going OB on their tee shot. Add in people going into those bushes on the right and it's really hard to find your disc. All those things factor into it, but you're going to have multiple groups on holes. And this is actually, I think, one of the big issues we're gonna get to in a second, but this is actually, I think, one of the major issues, um, not not the time in between uh, tee-offs, but actually how spotters, how officials allow you to play the holes. Um, Also, oh, A couple other issues that I think that should have been brought up. Uh, We are playing in foursomes, right? When you play in a foursome, you're adding a higher chance, a higher likelihood of multiple people playing, uh, having bad holes. If you play in a twosome, the chances of having both people play bad on a hole is a lot less likely than a foursome having two people play bad on the hole, right? If you just have one guy have a bad hole, it doesn't really slow the group down all that much. But if two people are struggling on a hole, heck, if three people are struggling on the hole, then that can play drastically longer. This is one of the reasons why I think foursomes are dumb. This is one of the reasons why I think you gotta go threesomes. Heck, I would love to see them even go twosomes on the final day or the weekend if it's a four day tournament. It is going to speed up the pace of play. Could you imagine playing and take away playing? Because most of you guys that are listening to this podcast, you guys aren't playing on the Pro Tour. You are consuming it. So imagine if I told you, hey, you are going to get nonstop disc golf action. You are going to see so many shots and it's going to all happen within a two hour time frame. If we were playing in twosomes, rounds would only take two hours, maybe two and a half on some of the longer courses but rounds would not be taking that long. 
You would not have to be trying to figure out a way to carve out hours of your day. Uh, you also have to remember we are competing with other sports as well. You know, being able to just have someone sit down and watch a couple hours instead of four, five, six hours for a round. I think that's something that disc golf definitely can use as an advantage. All these other sports are doing things, right? You have the running clock in football. You have the the pitcher count, uh, the, the the time limit that they have in baseball now. All these sports are trying to find ways to make their product faster. And disc golf, there's several things that you can do that greatly increase your product as far as like how long it is. And you get the same exact results. So I think that's one big thing that they can look at. Um, the other issue here too is someone that's taking 30 seconds to a minute per shot is really going to slow down pace of play as well, right? When I look at disc golf, it's a very relatively easy sport. Now, when it's raining, when it's gusting when there's elements involved with the weather gets a little bit more complicated but most of the most of the time disc golf is a pretty straightforward sport it's very similar to a sport like darts in my opinion bowling these sports where players don't really take all that much time the darts that i've watched now hand up i probably have not watched as much darts as simon lazat but I have seen a decent amount, I would say probably several hours of footage of dart championships and you know when they're all in the bars and cheering and all that stuff. They are not taking that long, right? The, the amount of time it takes them to walk to the line to throw, that is probably the same amount of time it takes them to throw the three darts. They are not having these long rituals in between the three darts. It's a bang, bang, bang. Right? Triple 20. Triple 20. Triple 20. I mean, it's bang, bang, bang. Um, I I think also you look at baseball too. I remember watching baseball back in the day. Oh my gosh. Some of these guys, every single pitch, right? Every single pitch, they would call for time. You know, unstrap, restrap, unstrap, restrap kick back in. Well, I mean, it was insane the amount of time these guys, these batters would take in between pitchers, pitches. Same thing with some pitchers. Some pitchers would take forever in between pitches. What has been, it, it took for forever for baseball to do this, but what have they finally figured out? Like, hey, that's kind of boring. That's also extending the games drastically. So to me, if you have a group of four guys, let's just continue to say that we're all playing with four people. If you have a group of, of four guys and on average those four players are taking 10 to 15 seconds to throw their shot and then you have another player on another card and every single shot they're taking 30 to to a minute that 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 group is like playing with like almost a five some or a six some of course they're going to play slower so that is something that needs to be addressed for sure. Now, obviously, all the stuff in between also needs to be addressed. How slow players are walking to get their disc. All these things factor into it. Um, but you can't say like that doesn't have an impact because if you're throwing and putting 60 shots, 70 shots, and you're taking 10 seconds, 15 seconds, sometimes 30 seconds longer on average than a lot of other people over the course of the entire round, yeah. That's going to have a huge impact, massive impact. Um, what else do I got here? Let's see. Um, so, so this is the other issue I want to talk about. Spotters are not allowing groups to throw when they should be. Let's talk about that first before we get into the next one. So there are multiple times where you'll have an Anthony Barella throw a shot on a hole that goes so far and all of a sudden, the spotter is now saying, okay, I can't let these guys throw because I saw a disc land 650 feet away from the tee. So now I have to assume everyone can throw that. You have to trust, and us as pros have to know what we're capable of doing. Now, I'm not talking about blind holes, right? That's a whole different ball game. There, we really have to put a lot of trust and faith on the spotters. But... When we're seeing the fairway and we can see, or heck, there are some holes 
where players are not trying to go super aggressive compared to other players. We should be able to throw as soon as we feel it is safe to do that. We do not need a spotter on every hole telling us to throw or not throw. That is a huge one, okay? That's slowing down pace to play drastically. The other thing too is we are playing drivable par fours in correctly, right? Drivable, drivable par fours can play very, very quickly if everyone plays the hole properly, the way the hole is designed, and they play it well. Drivable par fours can take a lot longer compared to that group if you play it incorrectly. So the last thing you want to do is prohibit someone, prohibit a group from throwing on a drivable par four and have them sit there and wait. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, shoot, like we just had this group wait for three minutes for this other group to putt. And now that other group left. And then this group just threw ta two terrible shots. So they're going to have to go to the drop zone anyways. They're going to go have to look for their disc anyways. They're going to have to do all these things that they could have been doing if you would have let them th draw, uh, throw. So how we should handle par fours, again, very simple. Golf already does this. Is if a group is on the tee before the other group is finished putting on a drivable par four, what the group in front, that is like putting or walking up to the putts or whatever, what they should do is step aside wave in the group to throw in the to the drivable par four let them throw their four shots and then finish out the hole so that way you never have this weird thing i know we've all probably have done there and been there and all that stuff of where you're like i can't throw yet i can't throw yet i can't throw that boom first available and now all of a sudden you just waited five minutes to hit the first tree and we're not even all you know what i'm saying like that is very awkward it happens to everyone how do you prohibit that Wave them in, wave them in, let them throw. Then they can figure out what they're all doing while you finish putting pace of play. Love to see it. Um, all right, some things that he said too. He goes on to, again, this is Robert Leonard from the Staggered Stance uh, podcast. He goes on talking about how they have all this data, right? And he also says that one of the reasons why they acquired Stat Mando was they have all of this data now to use, which I'm very curious if anyone from UDISC is out there and would like to come on, I would love to ha hear your guys's, like what happened there? Were you guys refusing to give data to the PDGA? Were the, was this something that you were wanting the PDGA to pay for? I mean, clearly they bought out Statmando. Maybe Statmando was a much cheaper acquisition than UDISC. I'm sure it was, but I'm very curious to hear from you, Disc, if you guys want to reach out, um, because I feel like that data has been around. It's not like this data is, has all of a sudden just existed this year because of Stat Mando. But he's claiming they have all this data, and they're going to start looking at this data of like how long it takes to play holes, what, how long it, certain courses play. I, that's all fine and dandy. But you don't really need to do any of that. All the stuff I just talked about, if they implemented that, that would be awesome. And also, when you're actually at the tournament, look at the leaderboard. This is what golf does. We play the same format. We play the same structure. Golf literally has people driving around in carts, making sure you're keeping up with pace of play. That, that, that is it. That, that, is, that is the end of the story. You got to keep up with it. And if you're not, if there's a two-hole gap, you go to that group and you tell them, speed up. And guess what? If you're in that group, sucks. Start walking faster. Take less time on your shots. I, I, I don't know what you want me to tell you. I mean, the fact that we just act like this is not an issue or the fact that we just want to brush this off to the side, this is a major issue in disc golf. Not just for the players, for the fans. A lot of this stuff I'm talking about pace of play is for the fans of the product. I have gone and watched my fair share, and a lot of times it's because I missed the cut and I'm not playing. Tournaments are boring, man. When you're sitting there and you... If we're trying to get more people to show up to tournaments to watch live, you know, let's not even talk about the online viewers. Let's just talk about the in-person experience. 
it's not really that fun sitting there waiting 20 minutes for the next group to go, waiting 30 minutes for the next group to show up. And you're just sitting there with nothing going on. A lot of these holes too on these courses, like you can't watch multiple holes. So a lot of times if you're, I mean, I mean, heck, talk about, talk about if you're, uh, if you're following a group, talk about that. Like how boring is that? Where you're just sitting and waiting 10 minutes every single time. I mean, the slug of just watching. I mean, it's just, it's just terrible. It's not fun at all. So this is a major issue that needs to be that needs to be addressed. I don't know why they didn't do anything this offseason to address it. Um, he get, he goes on and says the change that needs to happen, well, nothing. So he doesn't think there's a there's a change that needs to happen. Um, all we need to do is to adjust tee times. Okay, so let's say that you do adjust tee times. Let's say instead of ten minute gaps, twelve minute gaps, you make them fifteen minute gaps, twenty minute gaps. Are you making smaller fields? Are the FPO players playing a different course? Because you can't have 150, close to 200 players on one course and have them all play if you have those gaps in between. Here's another thing too. Why aren't we doing staggered starts? Why aren't we having people tee off on hole one and tee off on hole 10 in the morning? Have them play. And then in the afternoon, have people tee off on hole one and tee off on hole 10. I mean, if we're trying to get as many people on the course as possible and we want to extend tee times, right now when we start a tournament, after 10 minutes, there are four players on the course. After 20 minutes, there are eight players on the course. After 30 minutes, there are 12 players on the course. Imagine after 30 minutes if there was 24 players on the course. How many more players could get through in a faster time? Why aren't we doing that? Why is that never brought up? No one's ever discussed why we don't do that. It makes no sense. PGA Tour has been doing it forever. Now, they don't do it on every tournament, right? Some tournaments, they have much smaller fields. They don't do it. They don't do it on the weekend because that's when they make a cut and they want to space out the players that way. It's also the way the course was designed. But it's just a rule that everyone knows, everyone plays, and you know, like, hey, sometimes I'm going to have a morning round. Sometimes I'm going to have an afternoon round. And, you know, over the course of a season, it should work itself out. Why aren't we doing that? No one's ever brought that up. No one's ever addressed that. No one's ever said anything about that. That would greatly increase pace of play. That would greatly give you more of a window and a cushion. He continues to say, we need to be smarter about how we are grouping people. What the heck does that mean? What, what does that mean? Are we, are we handpicking now? I mean, heck, you already have enough people complaining about seeing the same people on feature cards, which, hand up, the, D, the DG, DN, DGN and Disc Golf Pro Tour, you should be put, putting the most popular players on feature card. There are, yes, there are people complaining, why do we always see this person? Why do we always see this person? Those people are in the minority. Most people could care less about watching random people that they have no idea. It, it, it sounds nice. Like, hey, it would be cool to have some random people on Lee Card, everyone. No, it wouldn't. Stop it. We want to see the biggest players. If someone wins a tournament and all of a sudden everyone's talking about that person and they're like got a bunch of hype around them, put them on a Lee Card. Paul McBeth on a Lee Card. Calvin on a Lee Card. A feature Card, whatever you want to. Simon on a f- Feature Card. Ricky. Eagle, put Gannon, put the best players, the most popular players, the people that want to tune in on feature cards. I don't, that makes no sense to me. So I would love to know what this means. What does this mean? We need to be smarter about how we are grouping people. So now, now, now you're going to handpick groups. I don't know about that. That one's, that one's going to be interesting. The feature card makes a whole lot of sense, right? Because that's your product. That is where you got to put your biggest names out there to get people to tune in. I get it. But if you're doing that for everyone, I, I would love to know what they're going to do for that. How, how, what, wh- how is that going to solve the problem? I would love to hear that. Um, he then talks about, in quotes, how is this going to affect the 40-person C-tier? 
No one gives a, gives a rip about the 40-person C tier. Robert Leonard? Why? When, when will the PDGA figure this out? It is okay to have certain rules, especially when it comes to not even just like how you play the game, but just how tournaments are structured and run. It's okay to have certain things specifically for the Disc Golf Pro Tour. That would make no sense for a C tier. Heck, they had like some bathroom rule in here that like every C tier or something now has to have like a bet. Like that's ridiculous. Some of these C tiers are playing courses out in the middle of nowhere that have no bathroom. Now you're going to force them to pay money to have a porta potty or something out there or whatever it is. And then that's just going to increase the prices. Like, I don't know if everyone would be down for that. I think a lot of people know, hey, I'm ju jumping into the C tier event. You know, there's one bathroom on the entire course. I, I, to me, it's just, again, it's just a swing and a miss by the PDGA where they're just like, hey, everything under our, umbr our umbrella all has to be the same. It makes no sense. Stop it. Stop it. Um, so, yeah. I give, <laughs> to wrap it up, I give the PDGA like a C minus, a C minus, maybe a D on the rule changes. I mean, there's nothing in here yet about uh, foot faults, which was a major, major issue this year. Um, very surprised that we didn't talk about that at all. Uh, still no nothing about um, FPO, who's really allowed to play in FPO. Uh, that is going to continue to hold weight. Um, and I get it too. Like maybe that is something that the PDGA or Disc Golf Pro Tour, they're waiting for something to happen outside of the sport to try to maybe not get involved with it, but not mentioning it or bringing it up at all, I think was a swing and a miss as well. All right, let's move on to some listener questions here. This one comes in from Twitter. It says, what does off-season training look like for touring pros? Is it like other sports, weight training, conditioning, keeping loose? How much field work should be done or putting practice? So, I mean, I, th I think we're going to probably see very similar off-season off regimens from players moving forward. Um, you know, the, where the sport is currently at to where it was when I first got in. Uh, is drastically different. I've, me and Yuli have talked about that on this podcast. Um, less people are driving five hours to the next tournament and popping out of their van or truck or car or whatever and immediately just going to the first tee and playing. Like Players are showing up now before their tournament rounds and warming up and getting throws in and putts. Um, I mean, the first year I came out, players would just show up 30 minutes, 15 minutes before the round, go straight to the driving range and just start ripping shots. And I'm just like, what, what is happening? Uh, so there are a lot of changes. So yeah, where you are going to see players in the off season, take their fitness seriously. We are going to see them try to maybe get a little bit stronger, a little bit quicker, uh, a little bit more flexible, potentially more range of motion. Those things are going to come into play. Now, when it comes down to like field work, I think uh, I don't think you necessarily need to spend all that much time on field work. Um, you know, I think 45 minutes here or there can do a big, big, uh, can help you out a whole lot. And I think uh, some of the best advice I got from, you know, some of the top coaches in golf was like, you don't need to show up and practice everything the same amount of time and do that through the course of the week. You got to just feel where your game's at and what you're lacking on. And like, okay, I need to spend a little bit more time doing that this week or today. Uh, I think that's the best approach going forward. You know, you go out, you play a practice round. Maybe you, uh, you're you off on one of your shots, you know, timing or something. Yeah, maybe next to the next day or maybe right after your round, you spend 10, 15 minutes trying to iron that out. I think that's going to increase you versus a lot of times, especially from – you know, the amateur level, you see a lot of people just do field work and they just go to a field and just throw as hard as they can. Um, ultimately, that's actually not going to really help you all that much if you're looking to be more accurate or angle control or any of that stuff. If you're trying to just, hey, I only throw 300 feet, I'm trying to throw 350, sure, go for it. Um, but that is such a small aspect of disc golf. 
Will there be any newish players emerge next year to challenge the top players? Yeah, I have a little list here. Um, I picked kind of some names that maybe have bounced on the leaderboard once or twice this past season that you might be familiar with, but not names that are household names yet. Uh, I still think Mari Vilma, Vilman, uh, European player, very solid. Uh, I, I think if he came over to the States and actually did a full tour similar to what you see from some of the other top European players, I think that would be a name that you know has a potential to pop off at a couple events. Uh, Zachary Nash, another guy that has a very solid game. I've played with him a couple times this past season. Uh, massive forehand and uh, pretty good distance on his backhand as well. I think the big thing with him as as we're kind of seeing a lot of the top players right now is it's, it looks like effortless power, right? Um, it doesn't really look like he is trying to throw hard. Uh, and he does that on both sides. Um, I'm not really quite sure what is the missing link for him. I'm guessing it's probably just consistency, which is probably consistent with a lot of the people on tour. Uh, but that, that is a name to keep a lookout. Nate Hecker also very solid young player. Uh, Braden Sides had a couple good tournaments. I think that is another guy that can pop off. And Jaden Rye, we've seen him have a couple good tournaments, especially uh, DDO. He seems to always kind of play good at Emporia. So Jaden Rye is another young player that, um, you know, these guys, all these guys I just listed here, probably outside of Mari. Mari's just basically if he comes to the States. But these four other players I've listed here, you know, if they make good strides this offseason, those are some guys that definitely can put themselves in the mix in 2025. What is the path, if any, to disrupting Gannon's dominance moving forward? An established vet regaining former glory, a youngster with stuff left to prove, or a completely new entity entering the sport? Yeah, I think it's going to be a combination of the three, right? You know, I think... I think having Ricky be able to pull off some wins, Simon, Eagle, Paul, those type of players, Calvin, um, pulling off a couple wins here and there. Um, and then I think, you know, when we're talking about youngsters, I think we're talking, you know, maybe an Ezra Robinson and Anthony Barella, some of these guys also, Cole Riddell, and we saw some good um, tournaments from him. I think some of the youngsters popping up as well. Um, and then, yeah, I, 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 I would be kind of shocked if there was just a random name that we've never heard of that didn't tour last year, just pop on tour and like give Gannon any sort of trouble. I I, I don't really see that happening. Um, but maybe, you know, in a couple years, one of these, you know, one of the names I just mentioned earlier, maybe one of those guys kind of uh, establishes themselves a little bit more. What would it take for you to win a pro tour next year? Be very specific. Um, okay. Well, I think I would probably have to play one of my best tournaments ever. And also, I think it would have to be on a very challenging course. And I think it would also have to be difficult conditions. I think you would have to add in the element of course management, which unfortunately a lot of these courses requires zero to almost none uh, course management out there. So I think you would need to have all those factors play into it for me to potentially win next year. Um, how about Yuli? I think Yuli just needs the right course. I think there's certain tournaments, and he would be the first to tell you this, that he probably knows he can't really win out just because of the distance uh, issue. You know, for him to have a good round, he's, you know, getting 14 birdie looks and other guys are getting 16, 17, really hard to beat those guys over a three, four day tournament. Um, but I think there's a handful of, a handful of courses that Yuli definitely could win. Um, I would say his big thing would just be like keeping the disc in bounds. Uh, he's a fantastic putter. So just be limiting the penalty strokes. And then finally, Paul McBeth, Will Paul McBeth win next year? I think so. Him going two years in a row without a win would be pretty crazy. Um, you know, he is still one of the talent, most talented guys on tour. Uh, it's just the talent has kind of surpassed him a little bit compared to what he once was. Um, but that doesn't mean he can't go out there and have a great tournament. The only thing now is he, for him to win he has to play extremely well, and there's got to be a couple guys that don't play their best. That's kind of the nature of the game right now. 
Thoughts on all of these following proposals for the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Oh, this is going to be good. All right. Number one, make the President's Cup at least a two-day event. Let's see some doubles, mixed doubles, match play. Yes, me and Yuli have been saying this. This needs to be a tournament that is outside of the European Open, needs to be separate, something that isn't just talked about for a day and then immediately forgotten because you have a major in a couple of days. Alternate the President's Cup between the U.S. and Europe. Um, have it kick off the Euro summer swing. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't hate that either. Um, you know, especially if you did it something like every two years or something like that, you know, where it's not every other year. Uh, have it sometimes in Europe and sometimes in the States. I think having that, that four-year buffer of, hey, we haven't had a, pre- a, a President's Cup in four years. It's coming back finally. I think that, I think that will have a lot, of, uh, a lot of weight right there. I like that idea a lot. Have a Manufacturer's Cup match play event between USCGC and the Tour Championship. I don't hate that. I don't know if I like the timing of it. Um, a Manufacturer's Cup to me doesn't really feel like an end of the year event. To me, it feels more like a fun mid event, mid season event. I would say. I, I think if you put it towards the end, I think it it uh, it might lose a little bit there. So I, I would love to see it more towards like the middle of the event away from all the majors and have it just kind of be its own fun little thing. I think people would get, would get behind that. Make the all-star event part of said manufacturer's event. Yeah, I don't hate that either. Just throw it all in together. Have the all-star event as a one to two day lead up as part of a President's Cup. Uh, again, probably probably anti that. I think they need to be separate from, from uh, one another. Um, because you said like, you know, you're, you're citing the MLB, NHL, NBA, um, the, what you're missing is like the president's cup is like the writer's cup, right? It, uh, writer cup, it's a, a massive, massive event and it deserves to be on its own. Standardized champions cup as the wooded major. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. Stop having random one to two disc golf pro tour events in Europe during the season. Just ha- host five to six events there in July and August. Yeah, I think I think if we really want to try to build up the the European swing, you got to make it to where everyone can just fly over there once. Then we're all over in Europe for a month or so, playing a bunch of events, and then we fly back. This fly over, fly back, fly over, fly back. I don't think disc golf is quite there just yet. Uh, but yeah, great, great. I love that. Great proposals. Um, next question says, would reducing the number of pro tour events be a good thing for the tour? Would this allow them more time to promote funds, set up each event? All the events seem to be, seem to blend together and doesn't build as much hype and suspense. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the way we are right now is I think we probably do have too many events. Um, and I, the reason I say that is because I don't think our events are really making a lot of money. So the big money, and maybe we need to get Jeff Spring on here too at some point to talk to him. But but I believe the main money from the Disc Golf Network is through the subscription service, right? People paying however much it is for all their different tiers for, for the ability to watch live coverage. Now, if you had four events during a month and then you cut that down to two events, would a lot of people cancel their subscription service? I don't think so. Maybe, but I don't. I don't think so. And um, you know, would they be able to make more profit just having two events? Because you're, if we, if we're making the assumption that people aren't going to cancel their subscription because you're going from four events to two events, then. You are saving if you if, and again. If we're making the assumption that most of these tournaments you're losing money, like actually in the uh, the cost of travel, setup, all that, you're losing money. Um, then I, that makes a lot of sense. Now, if you're gonna come, they're gonna come back to me and say, "Hey, if we only if we, you know, we're making tons of money on all these events, we need to do as many as we possibly can." Then I'll stand corrected, but. Um, where it sits right now, I don't think that is necessarily the case. 
Um, it would be interesting to see them take more time, put more effort, funding, and everything into tournaments to see like, hey, maybe maybe they get these tournaments looking looking a lot better with that. All right, final question here: Should players bag should players bags be limited to a certain number of discs? Having a disc for every shot shape reduces the level of a skill a player needs to manipulate their throws. Um, should there be restrictions on discs? Like in golf, pros can't have wedges over 60 degrees. Yeah, so uh, this is another thing that I don't think I see eye to eye with a lot of people. I agree with you. I think the easier you make a sport, the harder it is for players to really uh, separate themselves, right? And... Disc golf is still extremely young sport, so you still can have that separation. But at a certain point in time, there's gonna, you know, you're going to want to try to find ways to separate even more. And you know, you you hit the nail on the head by having a disc for every shot, by not having to really change how you throw a disc. Rather, you're just changing what you throw. Um, that definitely does make disc golf a lot easier. Now you could still say you could say the same about golf, where it's like, well, yeah, you they change clubs, you know, they hit a seven iron to a five iron. First off, the 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 club is longer, right? The length of the club changes, so your swing with a five iron is not going to be the same as your swing with a driver. It's not going to be the same as your swing with a uh, a wedge in your hand. So that's the first thing. Where in disc golf, whether you're throwing an understable disc or an overstable disc, depending on how you want the flight, yeah, maybe you change the angle a little bit. Um, But it is a lot easier to do. The other thing I would say, and what you said there is like, you know, the wedges, there's a limit to the degree that you can put in your bag, right? Um, And the reason for that is they don't want people to be able to bust out an 80 degree wedge and just be able to have a ball fly right up in the air. They want, you know, if you want to hit a flop shot in golf, you have to open that face up. If you want to try to get, you know, splash yourself out of a bunker, you got to open that face up. And whenever you open that face up, it does get a little bit scary. So I would love to see it. Uh, Who wouldn't like to see it? Probably a lot of the disc manufacturers. They probably wouldn't like to see it. Um, Who currently are the ones that are funding a lot of, the pro side of disc golf. So I don't know if this will ever change, uh, but I would, I would like to see it. Cause I do think there are pe- players that are very talented with manipulating the disc. Um, I think Simon Lazat's one of those guys, Isaac Robinson, Gannon Burr. These guys are getting really good at manipulating the disc and not just interchanging the disc out with another one. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to see it. Whatever ha- will ever happen. Most likely not. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, a little housekeeping here. Last week we had Imposter episode two come out. So hopefully you guys are enjoying the Imposter series over on Foundation Disc Golf. If you um, haven't tuned into that, go to make sure you go to Foundation Disc Golf and uh, search Imposter. Two episodes have come out. I think another one is coming out uh, today. So hopefully you watch that and enjoy that as well. Um, it was a lot of fun to film, so hopefully you're enjoying that. I also am throwing in, which I think this will be announced probably in the next, I don't know, few weeks maybe. Uh, I'm going to be throwing in some disc out of my own personal collection for our foundation mystery boxes on Black Friday. Those are one of the, the biggest items all year that we do, and uh, I'm throwing in some little goodies for uh, you guys for that, for a nice little search. And um, next week, Yuli should be back. Silas will be back. We might have a couple guests on as well. Uh, we will be talking biggest storylines of the year. So we'll be doing like probably a nice little recap of all the stuff that happened uh, this past season. And then also we will be doing a full breakdown on the 2025 Disc Golf Pro Tour schedule. Will this be set in stone? Probably not. You know, we see them move around. It's... Uh, you know, 
if you get the right people complaining about something, it will normally get changed. So we will see how that all pans out. We'll see if there's any player movement. I mean, and we're in November right now. Most players aren't probably going to do anything drastic until sometime mid-December. Obviously, around that New Year's time is when we start seeing a lot of the uh, movement. We'll make sure we get those players right here, talk to them about what made them change sponsors and how it's going to be looking going forward. And uh, yeah, off-season. We're in full swings now. Full swings, off-season mode. Uh, so we'll keep it pushing, keep it kicking. Hope you guys enjoyed this podcast and we'll see you guys in the next one. Take it easy.